Dave, it's so good to see you. It's pretty late for you tonight, I believe. Oh, good to see you, brother. Not too late. Not too late. About 11 p.m. And it looks like you're in a boxing ring there. Yeah, that, that is actually our boxing ring. <laughs> it, it's a virtual background, but it is my boxing ring, the, the one we have out in our bush camp. And, and uh, you've, you've been in a boxing match with the Prime Minister, I believe, in the federal uh, elections. How did that go? I did actually challenge him to sort it out in the ring with me. I thought I told him it would save a lot of uh, uh, time and, and money. And also I thought the pay-per-views could help repay the national debt, you know, but he didn't go for the idea, unfortunately. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd have a different prime minister now. What yeah. was the outcome of the uh, the election? Yeah, look, I mean, I got a few thousand votes, but I mean, I was never going to um, uh, beat Albo, who's now our prime minister, who's an old friend of mine, and I've got nothing but respect for him, but um, I do think there have been enormous problems with the way that the government's been working. And I uh, felt needed to stake a stand and say something, you know, this seemed to be the way to do it. And um, yeah, I think what, what I was really trying to do with that was just be a voice for a lot of people who have been voiceless over the last two years um, in re through the lockdowns and things that have been come out of the pandemic. And um, I've seen a lot of people who were on the edge get pushed over the edge. And I've, I've literally lost uh, friends. I mean, I've, I've had a friend die for from the coronavirus as well, yeah. possibly. These are minorities, who are we thinking of? It, the particular, well, uh, the people who had mental health problems were, were one group of people I was very familiar with who were struggling. Uh, in our country, though, I think the uh, experience of the, of the government lockdowns was harsher on certain minority groups. It, it seemed to be targeting certain areas. Why was that? Yeah, people had their own theories, but um, certainly the Lebanese Muslim community in Sydney felt targeted, and I think with good reason. Um, in certain areas, we had helicopters going overhead boom, 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 during the night, police coming around during the day, calling you to make sure everybody was at home. You know, it was, it was um, very much like a prison situation, and some people had come, fled from, these people had fled from countries <laughs> like... Uh, uh, Lebanon, something where, where they'd been locked in their homes before, you know, and that they were not welcoming that. And we had some incidents, um, an incident particularly where a young man had a heart attack while being assaulted by police because he wasn't wearing a mask. And uh, that inflamed uh, the local uh, Lebanese Muslim community, and they were all coming out in force. And I thought, well, I will go there and pray with them. And I, I took my processional cross, actually, because I wanted to make it clear it was not a Muslim Lebanese issue. This was a human issue, and I was going to come as the white Christian guy and just stand with them and pray with them. But I got got caught by the police before I got there, and that was all. I got uh, arrested and fined, and uh, arrested know, for what? Uh, for trying to pray in public. I mean, it's um, the first time I've ever had to pay a thousand dollars for trying to pray. Uh, and. I explained to them what I was trying to do, that I was trying to help de-escalate a very tense situation. In, in, you know, and I just want to go and stand with these people and express my sympathy and, and support for them. And they agreed with the intention, but <laughs> they arrested me anyway, you know. So and you were um, wearing a clerical shirt. Oh yeah. Yeah, I was carrying a processional cross. I wanted to make it very obvious what I was all about. <laughs> I had a little group with me who'd gone to pray with me, you know, and we were all fine. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it, the experience here was very extreme for some people. People, a lot of, quite a lot of people died. And um, as I say, I mean, people die of the virus too, and I don't want to un underestimate that at all. I lost a good friend, friend to the virus in Syria, not um, here, but I, I lost more friends, you know, kids I work with. Uh, you know, I remember one of my kids in the boxing club, he just, he said he'd gone to see his dad and he found his dad had hanged himself when he got there, you know. You don't get over that, you know. Uh, he's not a young kid, he's a young adult with his own child, you know, but, and that gives him the motivation to go on. And we, you know, we work with that. But I, I've been working with quite a number of people like that on the edge, just being pushed over the edge. And I've seen, I know like five people who've suicide over that period. And, Again, as I say, the, some of them, particularly the Lebanese Muslim community in our area, felt they were being targeted, and I think with reason.
Yeah. Um, have you felt the church has been sympathetic or behind you in this? I, I feel the church has been absolute dead loss. I mean, I hate to say that, brother. Um, it, it's interesting. I've seen we, we've I've been a bit a part of the sort of freedom movement, so called, in um, which is how I ended up running for the as a political candidate. And within that movement, there's an enormous uh, movement of, of grassroots spirituality, if I could put it that way. You, you'd be surprised. I've been asked to open a prayer at the rallies. Um, we had a massive rally in, in Canberra with half a million people, I think, and I, I had the privilege of opening a prayer. I mean, who pray? This is Australia. You know, we don't pray <laughs> at rallies. You'd often hear two or three people pray in a rally. Um, so enormous... Uh, some I know some people say, oh, I think Australia was targeted, you know, by the globalists because we don't have the spiritual resources because we're a very secular country. And I said, well, if that's the case, I think they underestimated God because... There's been an enormous, I, I see, spiritual surge of faith at a grassroots level, but disconnected from the official church. And it's getting back to your point, uh, a great degree of disillusionment uh, with the established uh, church um, and mosque and other, you know, so it's, it, but interestingly, Christians mainly, but also some Muslims and some uh, uh, indigenous people here with their own sort of spirituality trying to link in uh, at that level. But, Is that because uh, they're not engaging in the issues that people care about? Yeah, they're, they're feeling they don't care. Um, you know, and the, the issues of, um, you know, government overreach and um, loss of freedom of speech and all of the associated issues which we've been looking at, you know. Um, yeah, they feel the church is just totally sided with the government in that regard, and which I think has been largely true. I mean... <laughs> The pandem pandemic is waning now, is it, in Australia? Yeah, yeah oh, totally. But, I mean, uh, a cynical person would say, well, we've had an election coming up, so, so it'll look very lovely for a little while, but who knows what comes next, you know. So, yeah, I'm not confident. Uh, you know, this country became something which just looked completely alien to me there for a while. You know, with the, the role played by the, and we had that we had the military on the streets as well as the police, and um, it's unprecedented. It, yes, unprecedented. It just, you know, when I was a, a young man, I remember the Vietnam War was going on. I remember my dad used to say, you know, when you turn eighteen, I would have only been, you know, say eleven or twelve or something. But um, when you, you know, you'll have to put your name in the barrel. Maybe you'll get selected and have to go and fight in Vietnam and. I was horrified, terrified, you know, the thought uh, when I was a young, as a boy. But he would explain that, you know, our country stands for certain freedoms and we they're important to us. And it's, you know, he believed in the cause that it was worth dying for to, to defend those freedoms. <laughs> Why are we giving them all up now? You know, it, was, it really, uh, it seemed to me these were the things our mothers and fathers fought and died for, and here we were just throwing them away. In the name of health, of course, but there, I was seeing the other side of that health. I was seeing a lot of our young people and people on the edge being pushed over the edge, you know, people with mental health issues, people uh, on the edge for other reasons, just not coping. And, of course, other people, small business owners, owners their things falling to pieces as well and losing their homes and losing, yeah. you know, there's enormous amount. I appreciate there was a certain group that was being protected to some extent, but at the cost of a mass of other people I saw who were being devastated by it. Yeah. And so, uh, I felt the church was saying nothing to defend those people. No. I got it wrong. But, you know, I saw one church community house, community centre where people had um, uh, people with mental health issues and others who were in a communal living situation, and one of their persons, I was going to say inmates, because it was like that, apparently tested positive to COVID and the entire place was locked down and everyone had to stay in their room and they even limited whether food and, and uh, tobacco was allowed to go in there, you, you know, which um, that would only happen in a certain area in our city. It would not that ha happening in our sort of wealthy eastern suburbs. Um, completely different story where, where I think the impact of these government uh, lockdowns was barely felt. Yeah, but in some areas, it, it was just prison. 
thinking about the future and I was wondering what, what your, your, your vision of the future was. And I thought, well, it probably be reflected in your manifesto for the federal elections. I mean, what were the, what were the bullet points? What were the things that you were pitching for had you won? Yeah, I mean, what, what our party was on about was just maintaining individual freedom. So freedom of speech, uh, freedom of association, freedom of movement, freedom of religion, you know. Uh, I mean, I think the way the churches just sort of gave up on meeting, it devastated, again, a lot of people. Now, I appreciate some people are very good at tangible fellow, uh, virtual fellowship on, like, like we're doing now, you know, and I don't devalue that at all. But, um, you know, I, I teach boxing wrestling because i found touch is a very healing thing you know i, th I think the the hebrew word for skin bazaar i think it, it implies that, that that we're part of being it's what makes us human because we can touch each other yeah. you know and if we can't touch each other can we be fully human you know i think of you know greet one another with a holy kiss there was always this very physical dimension to christian fellowship and i found that the reason I teach boxing and, and wrestling and other things like this is, is the actual physical engagement, which is potentially so healing yeah. uh, for people who've been damaged. No, that's 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 what I do, you yeah. know. So it just just saying, well, you can't do any of that now, you know, putting a blanket uh, thing on that. You've got to close the boxing club. You've got to stop working with people. You've got to just have virtual relationship with them. So some people handle that just fine. Mm. Um, others. Don't so your mean, manifesto is focusing on freedom of speech, freedom, freedom of movement, freedom of religion. Freedom of movement, um, you know, freedom of association. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just th those basic things, which I think are, are so, um, things I always took for granted and things I thought, you know, this country stood for. And, you know, which, I, you know, I'm sure I thought the early Christians that sooner get fed to the lions than stop meeting, you know, but, but we were so willing to just sort of, throw that all away without questioning it. It was extraordinary. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, You're going to carry on fighting for those, even though you lost the election. I, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but you remember our friend Julian Assange said that we're living the last free generation. And uh, that's a scary thought. And I, I, I didn't take him seriously until the last couple of years. And all of a sudden I thought, well, maybe he's right. Maybe we are living in the last free generation. Well, if we are... Uh, I'm not going to go down without a fight. No. And if folk want to find out how they can get involved in the fight, your website is a good place to go. What's the what's the address? Oh, fatherdave.org. Um, Say again yes. slowly. Father. Fatherdave.org. 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 Father yeah, but I've got a newsletter and a blog and love to keep people, love to connect with people and uh, see if we can't together try and take a stand. Dave, it's been great to catch up with you. Thank you very much for this uh, interview. Bless you. Bye-bye.